Okay, what I've done here is I've drawn this line. And this line is going to represent a hypothetical uh, surface on an east-west transit. Uh, direct straight line due from west to east. And this is will become a cross section. Instead of looking like on a map, looking down, if you take a map and sliced it and were to look at all the stuff sideways, that would be a cross section. And this is just my uh, topography. Now, say the year is, I don't know, 1920. A state geologist came out and noticed that this hill right here was basically from here to say here was a white quartz sandstone similar to the St. Peter and say he named it after this hill say he named it the the White Ridge Sandstone now that is a formal unit and that does fit the North American Stratigraphic Code, so it is legitimate, although in 1920 there was no North American Stratigraphic Code. But say he mapped this and he saw this and he named this after the ridge, and he noticed using what we call strike and dip, which actually is a part of structural geology, that these beds dip this way. Now this is surface, so he doesn't know how far this propagates or anything like that. And say no more geologic work was done, it was just a, we'll say like a grad student thesis or something like that. But in 1945, Farmer Joe comes and drills a well to look for water. So he drills his water well down to right about here, and another one further east, right about here so he can water his fields. And he noticed that at this level and this level, he hit a white sandstone. Now, chances are that this white sandstone is this. So, tentatively, we can draw our line like this. So we have the top of the sandstone. Also, we'll say he encountered a thick shale right about here, and say that shale also outcrops here. Now that shale is not named yet, but we can tentatively do that. And that this unit at the surface here uh, we'll say that the first several feet or so are covered. You can't really tell what it is. But we'll say under here he hit a limestone. Both unnamed. Okay? And that would be 1945. And say in 1950, there was renewed geologic interest in this area because of something that hasn't been mapped yet, but is in the air is known to be in the area. So somebody goes back and looks at the 1920 records, the 1945 records, sees this shale, sees this limestone, and decides to name this shale, the Bridge Creek Shale, uh, and this limestone, the Patters Lake limestone. And we'll just assume for namesake that these are local features, lake, a lake and a creek. Um, and this was already named, but in order to study this new economic potential, he comes out over here and sees he's got a granite that has a lot of quartz veins in it. Let's say that that's what they're looking for, that this granite is what they're looking for. Okay. And we'll say that granite, named for some other place, some other where, but is the same granite. Say they take a few samples and get an age on it, and it's the same age as the type section granite. That this granite is the Sleepy Hollow. Now in order to assess the economic viability of this, so they come in and start drilling some holes through here, a deep one. 
through here, another one, through here, another one, and let's say that they get permission from the farmer and this because they want to assess the economic viability of sandstone too, so they drill another one here. And let's say that this, bar, this drill hole is A, and that is nothing but granite. This is B, and granite is encountered right here, so they stop the bore. This is C, no granite is encountered. And this is D, and they encounter the bottom of the sandstone right here. So, with this information, we know we now can do this and say that this sandstone basically forms a thickness like this. Now in C what they encountered down to a depth of here was a rhyolite and that same rhyolite was encountered here. And we'll say that the bedding angles in this core that they took are the same as in the White Ridge sandstone. So we can assume that this rhyolite comes like this. And let's say this rhyolite yields an age of 450 million years. Now, we'll say it's a reddish rhyolite, and we'll say a few miles north that another rhyolite with the same age has also been encountered under a white sandstone, under this specific white sandstone and it yields the same age. Um, so, and we'll say that one's called the Chesterton Rhyolite. Okay? Now what's encountered in B is we said A is all granite, B is granite down to there, so we can do this, but more than that we can't say with any confidence. But what we also see in B are several layers of metamorphic rock. And we'll say that we see here, we see a slate, and down here we see the quartzite, and down here we see a meta conglomerate. We see, and these are unnamed, but from here, now the, now the reason why that this wasn't discovered before at the surface we just assume that it's covered with five to ten feet of modern soil and nobody's really noticed it before. Uh, which actually is a very common occurrence. And when you have flat line topography, generally the geology, that's the last place to be studied because exposure is very poor. You want to look where there's good exposure. Hilltops, ridges, valleys, stuff like that. We'll say for the sake of argument, a slate of quartzite and a metaconglomerate were taken. Now, this we'll say that this metaconglomerate it's discovered to have an abundance of copper in it. So they come back and do D right here. And they do E right here. That they encountered these beds, these contacts in the... <clears throat> now we'll just say that they encountered these contacts where I drew them before. Um, because this is an example. Um, and in E, all they had was quartzite. So you can make a tentative correlation that this is quartzite. In D, they hit the granite again at the very bottom, and they hit the meta conglomerate here, but here they have slate. And E is all quartzite. There's no conglomerate, no shale in it. So now what we can assume about this here is that this quartzite is actually a tongue. You know, I, I talked about that earlier. It comes in like this and can assume to be like this. And this meta conglomerate lies below it and goes this way. And this is what they want for the copper. So now these three previously unknown units are thick enough to be mapped and can be named. 
So let's say that they name this the Black Creek Slate, this the Denver the Denver Quartzite, and let's say they name this the Sheridan Conglomerate. Okay, now the question is how do we arrange these? Now we have a tongue and we have two units above, one above, one below. Now these are previously unknown. Now this is named, this is, form, this is a formal unit at formation status, so is this, so is this, this, and this. Um, so we want to look at this part and to understand the geology, we, we do understand that there is a connection here. This is igneous, igneous, and this is metamorphic. These three rocks are metamorphic in here. So they do share a common bond, even though they're lithologically distinct. Um, and then we have sedimentary rocks above that. So we can, we can take this, and the most logical thing to do here would be to make the Black Creek Slate a member, the Sheridan Conglomerate a member, and the Denver Quartzite a tongue within a single formation. And we'll say that there's a town just to the south named, named Echo, Echoville. So that these three together, Echoville formation. And these, are, these two are individual members, and this is an individual tongue within the Echoville. Now, in a way to better understand how these are related, we have, like I said, we had an age on this, and we have an age on this, and we want to group things together into groups. Now, we'll assume that these are known to be all one geologic system or period. Now, these three can be grouped in together to form a single group. They don't have to be, but they can be. Now, this doesn't need to be put into a group because it's not directly related to the units above and below. So we can just leave that as a formation. This is a formation. And um, say that there's an unconformity here, and this is at 450 million years, the, Ch the uh, Chesterton, and the Sleepy Hollow Granite gave an age of 1.25 billion years ago. So these need a time to undergo metamorphos metamorphism in order to uh, become metamorphic rock, but this is igneous. And so we know we have an unconformity right here. Now what we could do with the Echoville formation of Sleepy Hollow Granite is we could lump them together into one group of rocks, but generally that's not what we would do here and we shouldn't do it here because we know the granite's one and a quarter billion years old and this is 450 million years. So you have a huge amount of missing time here. Anywhere between one and a quarter and 450 million years ago, the Echoville could have been deposited. So um, that's basically how stratigraphy works over time. And that's just a general example I made up. And it's kind of cool to name all these things, but this is more practical than just naming. And I'm going to get into an example using groundwater here in a second.